So tell me about um, how did you first hear about this job position for Nickelodeon? Um, how did you get to work there in the first place? Well, um, I fresh out of college in 1990, early 1990. I was here in Orlando. Um, I've always, you know, just, you know, being a freelancer, always looking for new work. Um, so it was, it was just kind of an arduous process here trying to get into Nickelodeon. It took me, it was close to almost eight, nine months of constantly calling into the, uh, into HR just to try to get in on a gig just to work. And I wanted to befriend a lot of the people in the, uh, in the crew areas that would crew the, uh, crew the shows. And every week I would just be adamant about calling and making friends with whoever was on the phone. And by the, you know, couple of months into it, it was, everybody knew who I was every time I called. I got a call, uh, from Nikki Boland. She was over the art department at the time uh, for Nickelodeon. Um, she says, hey, can you come in, you know, be a day player on a Lakers window? And I said, sure, when? And she goes, in about an hour. And I was like, whoa, okay. And I knew how much I was trying to get in there, so I dropped whatever I was doing that day. And uh, sure enough, I went in there. And my first day on Nickelodeon was working on a Lakers window, building her sandbox. So that from there, it just kind of went, and it just started snowballing into other shows and making friends. and and being there for a while. I think that was the day that uh, the art director, Sam, forgot his last name, forgive me for that, but he uh, he passed away. And it was the day that they were having his memorial service, and a lot of the crew was not going to be that set that day, so they were bringing a bunch of day players to um, cover. And that just happened to be my in into Nickelodeon. Hmm. Okay, that that's fascinating. And what was your first impression of stepping into Nickelodeon Studios for the first time ever? What was your impression of it? Well, I, it was it was really cool. I mean, I've been you know prior to me going to Nickelodeon since it was at Universal, I was uh, very big in audio and, and, and sound tech, and I actually helped Nickelodeon was being built back in the day. Um, I was I was there, and I used to see them uh, setting it up and and whatnot, and it was just really interesting, and that, that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to work there. Um, I actually was, when Universal was being built prior to all that, I was there when I helped build uh, Ride ET. Um, I helped build uh, King Kong back in the day. I was a lot of sound tech. We did a lot of the sound design and sound effects for all the uh, all the show rides. Mm -hmm. But when I was uh, walking around, I used to walk back a lot and see them go construct the Nickelodeon that was it just kind of burned inside of me. I really want to go there. So when I got in, it was it was it was pretty I was pretty elated, you know. Unfortunate of the circumstances, but how I got in, but it, you know, it, it it just snowballed into a relationship that I to this day I've made friends and I still work with. So. Yeah, that that's interesting because just to touch on the universal part, like it's a it's so much it's so cool how much the park has grown over the years. Like you mentioned King Kong and E. T. and it's coming back in some ways a new King Kong ride too. I mean, does that like really what was your favorite ride back in the day though, to go on like attraction? Wow. Um yeah, I, I don't know. They were all pretty cool. I mean, I must have rode King Kong, I mean, a thousand times. I mean, I, I don't even, you know, I got sick of it pretty much. And same thing with E.T. I mean, E.T. is still there today. Mm -hmm. Here we are, what, 2015, E.T. is still there. Yeah. Um, why, I don't know. But, um, but you know, it was a pretty cool ride. And I just went there recently uh, when I brought my kids there who, you know, are now, you know, 13, 14, 15. And, uh uh, and then going on to the ride, I had to go on the ride because they, you know, just going there. And I would actually hear some of the sound effects that I designed were still there. And I could say some of them were me, you know, because when we were doing this in the day, we would just go into the studio and make the sound effects ourselves, what we needed, and crafted them and, and placed them into the EPROMs back in the day when they, that's what they used to burn the sound effects on, uh, the triggers. So when we would go to the ride, I'm like, here we go, and this is the sound. I made that sound. And the boys are just looking at me like, you got to be kidding me. This is phenomenal. So that was that was kind of cool. So I don't know. So you, you asked my favorite ride. I mean, I think um, when Terminator came out, when Terminator first came out, when it was fresh on the uh, on the lot, oh, I think God. that was the best ride. Yeah, that was fresh because the movie was still fresh in everybody's mind. And um it didn't break down as much as it did you know, nowadays. It, it's still there today, I think. But uh, mm. 
I just remember going there. That was that was the best at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting and really ahead of the time that show. And going back your um days for Nickelodeon, can you describe a typical day of um what was it like working there for you? Like you know, just to for the art department basically. It's the first, depending on what show you're on. Um, it depends on what you call time for. But a typical day was um, you know, we drive drive there and have to park in the in the employee parking lot. We were very rarely allowed to park back lot unless we had special parking passes to get into the back lot. So we had to park. Outside the actual uh, the area, we'd have to walk in through security, and um, so that would probably be about a six a.m. call, sometimes six thirty, mm-hmm. and um, sometimes we wouldn't, you know, depending on the shows, we would be an eight a.m. call. But we would go there and just, uh, you know, we'd have a list of things to do. When I was working on Guts, it was pretty much we were building all the all the props, um, all the a lot of the stage stunt rigs and. And whatnot. There were so many things that we built back there. We had our own little art world back there. It was four or five of us there, and uh, we just had so much fun. We we created our own little world right there in between the two sound stages, and we had uh, you know we had fencing up there. So it was just like once you walked into our little fenced area, you were we were all in our own little utopia. You know, it was, it was you know it was really cool, and we had our own trailer. And we had uh, prop stored in there, and then also our offices were in there. But we just kind of we just had so much fun. And at that time too, there was a, all the other productions that were shooting in the other stages were always outside, and we were just uh, we would just have so much fun back then. But you know, a typical day was you know we would go there, get in there, do our do our thing, and then we'd go eat at the commissary where all the crew went and eat, all the crew of all the Universal Studios, and then we would just come back and. Uh, do our stuff, and if, depends if it was a shooting day, if it was, if it was a day that we were shooting, then it's just scheduled different to what it was, but it was, uh, it was a really cool time. Yeah, um, going back to the Guts thing, it was and still was the largest soundstage for Universal at the time and still is today. And I'm sure you guys had free range to do a lot of stuff in there since there was so much free space to do in that, um, for that show and that building. But just to touch on that show, like, do you remember what exactly what the Agrocrag, the trophy was made out of? Because it looked kind of crystallized wax to me. Yep. Yeah, no, Agrocrag, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you were watching the actual TV show, when the kids were holding up the, the award at the end of the show, mm-hmm. that's not what they went home with. That was a prop. Oh. So that one, yeah, so the original one, they didn't get the original ones till after. And we had them, those were especially made through a, a um, an agency or a company outside that formed the plastic and it was a whole acrylic with a real light in there, battery operated and a whole nine yards. The ones that we used, we had all these mock-ups. And uh, and they were basically, they were, you know, cut acrylic just and glued and, and frosted. And we had these green little, um, sometimes we put glow sticks in them. Mm-hmm. And we would break them open just before, you know, we needed to get them out there and stick them in the hole. And, and you know, they lasted for, what, 10, 15 minutes before they burned out. So they were good. And um, we would always would have, like, one or two standby crag wards on the back stage to keep when the kids dropped them or broke them or, mm. or something. There, there was always that hero prop that was always number one that we would always use. It was the pristine one. And then you had your other ones that had defects or whatnot, but just depending on what we were doing. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. Interesting stuff. A little bit that nobody really knows about. But. Interesting. I love that. Fun fact. And so that same one that we saw on TV, that would be the same one that every winner would hold up? Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty much every guy was holding up the same bag. Unless we, you know, unless there was a defect or we wanted to break in something or whatnot. And I just remember times, you know, back in back, back in the art world, and we knew that it was time for the props to come out. And we would be randomly trying to fix something because something went wrong at the last second or not. And so we'd wind up using one of the two. There was like three or four standbys. So pretty much every, every time there was an award show, yeah, it was the same the same one everybody was holding up <laughs> and did the kids know about before the show or did they didn't tell them after when they were um you guys you know that's not really what you guys gonna go home with did you tell them after you know what the kids are so excited they, they don't care i mean they're, oh. they just know they're standing on the thing and they got this agar crag they're holding and the real ones were, were not that much different they were pretty much the same size um but they were professionally made in other words they were they were really cast and molded and um so like a real a real deal 
so when they, we just told me, oh, this is not you. What, what, I just remember one or two times they would, with your face is just kind of like, this is not the real thing. I'm like, no, we're going to give you a real one. You'll get a real one plus all your other prizes that you're going to get. And it's not the, you know, they, they just kind of like, they, it's TV world. So once they understand and step behind the scenes and realize that they're not in the real world, that it's TV world, they, the whole concept of everything just kind of really goes easy on them and they understand it. It's, it's, it's actually a really cool process. Yeah, that yeah, that's understandable, and that's a good thing that the kids were just excited to be there. They didn't care about the prize as much. They were just happy to just, you know, be a kid basically, and that's really what I love about that. So, do you ever get to like keep anything from from the show that you still have today, from any props or anything that you made specifically? Well, define keep. <laughs> we weren't officially allowed to take anything, but you know, as prop guys and our part and you, we wind up having stuff left behind when the shows go away. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, there's there's this whole. Um, I don't know if you've been online and watched it on the uh, on the Facebook page. I think it's the '80s, '90s uh, Orlando television production. There's a bunch of people on there that post all their little memorabilia that they get from uh, that they had from Nickelodeon from. Letterhead, which I have a bunch. Of, I still have a bunch of Letterhead, Nickelodeon Letterhead mm-hmm. and envelopes that I, that I just never used and kept them here. And a bunch of magnets that are used for for stuff. But yeah, some of the larger stuff we I, we never really yeah. I never took. But um, but yeah, there's 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 all these little things and and you know, to be honest too, they even they even gave us uniforms to wear every time that like on guts we all had to wear. Uh, Converse sneakers with black shorts with the with the, with the global gut shirt, <laughs> and we weren't allowed to show the logo on the sneakers, so we'd have to use black gas on the sneakers to cover up the the All Star logo. Mm. And to this day, I st- I still have those sneakers and I still wear them, and they're still in excellent condition. I mean, they're twenty twenty five years old and they're the original Chuck. Mm. You know, they don't make them anymore in the United States, so those are I still have some of my Nickelodeon clothing and and uh. Stuff like that too, as well. Awesome, and well, Converse, those are classic sneakers. So hey, you gotta have them, you know. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I do believe that um, you guys, um, a lot of TV shows, they throw away stuff after resets and the season ends and stuff, and they reuse new ones. So that I can understand that part too. And you know, for you living in Orlando back in the day, it was really driving with film and television, and you know the whole Hollywood East thing moving that was surrounding it, but never quite lived up to it. Do you know what happened to that and why it sort of fell apart? Yeah, I mean, and being where I'm at now in the industry and, and being involved in a lot of the Florida film production world and stuff, um, there's a lot of hindsight 2020, and there's still a lot of ide- ideology as to why things never picked up. But basically, the bottom line is, you know, the industry itself, it, it, it's an industry. It's, it's called the film business. Mm-hmm. And for the lack of, and for lack of better words, the whole state of Florida was pretty much nothing nothing more than just a glorified back lot. So all the business came from L.A., New York, Chicago, where all the major business districts were, where, where, the, where the people thrived and, and developed the projects and financed the projects and all the legal work. All that was done outside the state of Florida. And so they would come to Florida and just shoot because of the great locations we had and the theme parks. And and back in the day when you had um, Universal was uh, just getting finished and Disney was, was already finished and you were all the start all these theme parks were starting to you know starting to develop here. It was just prime for Nickelodeon to come down here and, and just strike a deal with Universal and make that one of their their places of shooting. But to this to that time period it still wasn't a place you know, like the, the, the guys that, that, that ran Nickelodeon, the founders, their their offices were still in New York. Right. I mean, they were still based out of New York. They were still based out of L.A. But they, they would just come here and they would, you know, spend an extended period of time here. But they were having problems with, you know, getting talent down here and keeping them here. with always a hassle of people flying in and, and just dealing with all the infrastructure of being on location because it, it was a glorified location. And so for them, it was always easier to just go back to where they were. And, you know, if you're in New York and you're shooting in a studio in New York and you need a guest star to come in and ask you to happen to live in New York, it's nothing for them to get in the car and go drive there and do there for a couple hours and they go home. So, where, but if it was Florida, you'd have to fly them in, put them up for two days in a hotel and 
all that all that kind of fun stuff and and then it, it, your budget should go through the roof for doing all that or well, not through the roof for a little bit more money mm. so the problem with Florida is that there never was a proper business infrastructure placed here and um and basically I don't know if you've been following the trade right now, but you know Atlanta and Georgia is pretty much going through this huge boom right now with all their incentives. Yeah. and um but if you look back, what's happening to Atlanta is pretty much a carbon copy of what happened in Florida in the early nineties where you had um these macro studios for were being developed. Well, macro studios really weren't that big back in, in early Orlando days, but, um, but now they, they are where you have, like, you know, Tyler Perry, you know, the Oprah and yeah. Pinewood and all that stuff. They're, these stars are creating their own little studios to develop their own projects instead of going for the big major ones. Mm-hmm. But the issue that is, even Pinewood then moved into uh, to Georgia, their still main office is out in, in Europe. It's not in, in uh, Georgia. So you're kind of getting the same thing happening there. And, they, and the incentives are good. They're doing what they're supposed to do. But um, if the infrastructure is there, I mean, Georgia and Florida back in the day, it's pretty much, you know, the business decisions were made in L.A. and they're going to fly in their key people. All the above the neck guys are coming in via airline and staying there and then doing their shows and then leaving and taking with them all the money, all the incentives and, and all that. Florida never had good distribution channels, never had good legal Never had good investors here. You know, you come here to Florida, most of the money is either in tourism or real estate, and those investors wouldn't know wouldn't know how to do any kind of the uh, film investing or TV investing because it's not their forte. Where if you go out to L.A. and New York, you know, those deals are happening every day. So that's kind of where we're falling with all that. And I know now, currently, in the state of Florida, in the film office, we're working on trying to bridge the gap between the the private sector and the public sector to bring some sort of financing and funding models back to Florida so that films can be produced here, developed here, and distributed out of here. In other words, get some companies in here that have distribution, distribution channels and let them stay here. So, you know, so the money is developed here, stays here. Even part of the incentive program that they've been trying to push was this Florida First thing where um, the one the, pro- the projects that were developed in the state of Florida are going to get the incentives first, instead of the ones that are coming in from outside the state. Because what would happen is you'd get these these monstrosity budgets coming in, like Transformers and so many other larger productions, and they and they would just suck up the whole incentive program because you know they they have these budgets and they would come shooting the, the coast or Orlando or Miami and and just when they're done leave. And it's all good for the below the neck guys, you know, all those guys that are working, all the crews and the staff, you know, that they're just getting their hours or days and they're making their money, but the money's not being funneled back into the state of our economy outside of, you know, the, the typical money being spent on the production. Yeah, um, I I don't know if you know this, but I'm living in Atlanta and I sometimes wonder if it'll have be a long lasting term like or be a short lived term like the filming in Florida back in the day was. And I know you guys yeah. have been trying to get incentives back, but it just hasn't worked out for a couple of years now. And it's such a beautiful state to film and it's so much good things you guys can do there, but still the issue is people not seeding the right things that filming can do in the state of Florida besides the tourism and real estate, like you said. And I have to say, there was a lot of things going on because I I touched up on your history for Nick, and you also a promo producer for the Big Help that you guys did a lot of Big Help stuff in Florida. Things are for that? Yeah, that, that those were they're kind of vague for me because I only did like two or three of them. They weren't like a big big part of my repertoire, and that was at the time when I was transitioning out of Nickelodeon and going into more of my my own things. But what I remember from the Big Help um, is just you know being coming from the prop world. Could we just you know go raid the prop house and just go set stuff up in different locations in the, in the, in, the, in the locations? I think we use. We actually used a couple of producers' houses here in town. We actually just went down their neighborhoods and just kind of set up some of the stuff outside their house and just shot it uh, and used it for the promo. It's like an outside thing with the kids, you know, putting the grass in the, in the wheelbarrow and stuff. We actually used their kids in their backyards doing the work for the promos. So, and it was the same with Mr. Wizard. Mr. Wizard was, um, I did like two or three of those. I'm trying to remember. And those, 
and that and Mr. Wizard, he he you know, all his shows were already pre produced and done already in back up in up in up north, but they were just doing the promos to uh show that he was gonna be airing on Nickelodeon. And so I would just remember um setting that all up and, and I pretty much did most of the art directing for those things and, and went and got everything set up a little a little stage area and, and just they would just come in and just shoot it and we would just tear it all down and do it in another day. So mm. yeah, so that was that was kinda of like my my beginning of getting into the producing world. Yeah. With those little those little promos. Yeah, those the promos were really cool and I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm wrong or this or right, but I could have sworn I had saw Shaquille O'Neal one time for a big help promo in Keenan and Kel. Oh heck yeah, like, yeah. There was there was so much stuff going on in Shaquille back in the day because that's when Orlando Magic was was huge yeah, and he right. was part of Orlando. I actually worked on a couple of his music videos, right. but um, there, there was a lot of I mean Keenan and Kel. I mean there was a lot of a lot of celebs were part of the big help. They were bringing all these guys to come down here and. Um, and Nickelodeon was great because they brought in a lot of talent. They, they spent the money and they brought these people down here. I think Nickelodeon kind of brought Orlando into the 21st century, into the 20th century at that time. And they brought them, you know, it made them modern, mm-hmm. modern. Where I think back in the day in the early 90s, a lot of the stuff was being shown on USA Network. I mean, they were Swamp Thing, oh, yeah. you, uh, um, Superboy, yeah. uh, you know, all these little, you know, Leave It to Deer, all these little. They, I think it was Leave It to Be Return to Be Earth. Then there was Psycho, Psycho 4, one of the movies. So all that stuff was, we weren't really in the mainstream until Nickelodeon came down. Oh, it yeah, just definitely. became such a hot spot. And just it literally, literally, it brought, if it, 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 there's any testament to the film industry itself and how it's so powerful in the effect of tourism and the economy of an, of an area, it's Nickelodeon because they did so much here in Orlando. I mean, I can't believe millions of people that would come down to be part of Nickelodeon Studios and to come see it and tour it and to see all these their 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 fans, their their stars that the fans were so enthused with. Um, so that's a, that's a great little you know a little case study for anybody that does any kind of marketing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know because I know the commercials where you, um, the kids were promoting um, um, the audience to come down here, like um, Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida. You know, come visit the world's first headquarters for kids, and so I remember all of that stuff. And I have to say, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Good. No, I was gonna say I, I remember so many times they, they they would have the live tour going through not only through the Universal backlot but through Nickelodeon. Yeah, that's and. Right. Um, yeah, and, and and back in the day, every every department had one one wall of its department was open to the public. So if you were in the wardrobe uh, you know, part of the, of the of the building, then you know you had your three hard walls, and then one wall would be all glass because you would see you know you'd be turning around all of a sudden you see a bunch of people looking at you, you'd be like what the heck? Mm-hmm. You have to you have to remind yourself that every day. Same thing in the in the tech department upstairs, and and even in the prop department when. Um, we would do stuff on stage. You would, you know, you, you would look up. You would see the glass windows over the stage, looking up, and you would see people just walking and looking. And, and we would put shows on for them sometimes too. So even when we would make the gack in the uh, the kitchen, we would just do some funny things. And you know, sometimes we'd actually bring kids in and let them kind of taste the gack and, and just see how it's made. Obviously, you couldn't couldn't give them the secret of how to make it because there was a formula. It was a oh, secret yeah. formula that nobody was allowed to discuss. And to this day, it's like, you know, I know how to make gack. And every time I go do some of my kids' shows, I, I make the gack. Awesome. It's kind of fun. Awesome sauce yep. right there. <laughs> and speaking, um, yep. touching back on that, um, have you ever been slimed, though? Officially, no, because it just never excited me. But, you know, we used to eat it, we used to make it, and it was just fun. So being knowing what it was made of, I just never really wanted to have, you know, a bunch of all that stuff dropped on top of me. Aww. <laughs> so I, I, I like doing the sliming. I don't like being slime. <laughs> so... But but hey, you got to do it, you know, for your kids though, just to see your dad and covered in slime, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. But now recently, you know, some of the other events that I've done, yeah, I've got slime before, and they, you know, I would take it up a notch, and we would just add a whole bunch of new ingredients into it. Just you know, we change the colors of it a little bit, but you know, we would we would do that. I mean, I remember while I was working in Nickelodeon at the day, we we actually were part of a a children's group and. 
every birthday that was in like every time a kid had a birthday, I would go make the jack and come back and I would just blind the kids and they would be so enthralled at it. It was really cool. Yeah, and I also the gag master used to do events around the country for like um you know go, going around the audience and have the kids just like you know the, the game lab shows that's what they do around the country they they used to do that too so yeah that's kind yeah. of similar to what you did and, and, and you know there's different types of gag I don't oh, know yeah. if you knew that yeah there's booger okay. gag and there's like um what else apple sauce gag there's also yeah there's the vanilla pudding one but there's different consistencies for different things depending on what they were doing. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I did know that. And how great was yeah. everyone and the staff who worked at Nickelodeon? I've always heard positive stories of how they still just, yeah. they're just wonderful yeah, they, people. There, there was no negative stuff. I mean, outside, you know, every once in a while, everybody had their tips and things, but everybody was real cool. They understood what they were getting into when you were working there. You understood your hours. It was always a 10-hour day. Um, and you know, you understood the rates, you understood what you were getting paid and you understood, it was all really cool. And it was just like, it, just being around creative people was, was exciting and fun being a creative. Now, you know, I can't tell you what it was like upstairs working on the third floor. Um, mm -hmm. I know those guys were always stressed out. We were just oh, joking yeah. with all that stuff, they, they, especially mm -hmm. when they would come downstairs and make decisions and changes that we've spent hours going in one direction. We'd have to be restop and redesign and go back and do something again. I just remember so much, uh, we, were, we were doing so much product development, just testing these, these things out before. It was us. We were the one, all these, all these little games that you would see on, on show, we, the prop guys, would test all this stuff out to make sure, number one, it was safe, and number two, that it worked, and, um, and that it worked properly. So we were, you know, I don't know if you remember the episode with the, uh, the bowling ball, the, the kids with the big on the uh, the big giant pins. They were like the ten foot pins. Mm -hmm. um, we would test that game out in the in in the back lot in the area, there, and it would be so fun. We would you know, just spend hours just playing with the games and, uh, and doing that. And then after after all the all the filming was done, we would reset for the next day. And sometimes we'd have some product develop it in the studio. After we would go in there, and the stunt guys would come in and they would rig up guests quote guests or just, you know, people that work there and we would test all the rigs to make sure that all the all the all they, they work properly. So it was pretty fun. You know, that's hard work I must say. And but in the end of the day, like it was still you guys did so much and you got, I don't think people understand the magnitude that people who work for the art department and props and all that stuff, how much they have to do because it's a lot just to create a set, you know. And just for you saying you had to guys had to try all those different things was it's really um, a lesson of what filming industry does, what filmmaking is like. Yeah, and part of that's all budgeted into the show. You got you got to budget your your L and D, your product development and research and development, and all that stuff in there to kind of figure it out. And then you just got to put a certain time limit on it. Mm -hmm. I think we did. I just vaguely remember a show that we did was called Camp Nick. I think it was Camp Nick or something I, like I that, where that. we tried it was a to pilot, put, wasn't it? Yeah, we, I think we did like one season or one one or two episodes as a pilot, I'm trying to remember, where we actually went out to a campsite and tried to create the Nickelodeon feel at a campsite with some of the outdoor games. Mm -hmm. You know, Lula, I know it was, it was almost like a Survivor type thing. You ever watch Survivor with their challenges and stuff yeah, that, I that we did? It was sort of kind of like that. Yeah, but it just never happened. I don't know why it never took off. That was like we remember. I remember making rafts, and we were we were out in this lake, just anchoring these things down. These kids had to do these challenges, and um, I think it was just too tough. Was the kids weren't used to the physical labor, of, you know, running and doing all this stuff. But uh, yeah, that's that, that, that's something that just vaguely fits in my mind that I probably should probably start asking some of my buddies to keep their remember about that. Gosh, I would have loved to see that pick up though. And that looked like Dick yeah. Bradley Baker who hosted that. I mean, I'm not. I don't even know who that was, but it looked like him. Yeah, I don't remember who the hosts were too much. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said it was all a fog for me that, that that time of year. I just there's certain parts that really stick out to me. And I, and I guess when I get around the other guys and we start talking, we'll remember things. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting for my life, you know. Even though it was only six, seven years, it did, you know, it, it was special, and I know it was special for a lot of folks because it was, it was a start of something. It was a movement. We created a movement. It wasn't like we actually changed the culture, literally. Literally, Nicholas changed the culture. Yeah, it's very rare when that happens. 
it's a rarity, and it's something. You know, there's very few TV shows that could actually do that, or networks or, or programs, and Nickelodeon did that on so many different levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hello. just like the book was out that came out like a couple years ago, The Sign, an Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age. I don't know if you heard about or read it, but it talks about all the different people who worked there and how much Nickelodeon created like this pop culture, like kind of this indie underground culture, but for kids and just understand what it was like to be a kid and just for that generation stuff. So I don't know if you heard that book, but it's a good read. Yeah, no, I did. I heard there, there's been so many of these retro books from coming out trying to. You know, bringing about the old stuff, and you know, a lot of that is too because a lot of the age now, the guys that are working on a lot of these shows, they're hitting their midlife crisis. Oh. You know, some of these women, men and women, and they're and they're starting to think back. And when that happens, you start, you know, they start to revive some of the old stuff they they worked on to try to bring it back to a certain extent. And that's just human nature, and it's really cool because um, you see that in culture as culture goes on through the years. You know, that each generation has their own flashback times tries to bring it back to a certain extent only for the new the younger generation to pick up and just kind of morph it to something new mm-hmm. so yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah. and you know speaking for nick studios which has been closed for gosh 10 years now and it's so missed by a lot of people and stuff but if there was ever like a create like a miracle for it to reopen one day would you like to see that happen for it to come back in orlando of course, yeah, only if I'm working on it stuff. Yeah, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man. yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I just, you know, and I'm looking at hindsight and, and where we are now in reality with, with the studios right now. I don't know if it would ever come back to, to mm-hmm. unless somebody was to recreate and, and get this whole you know, business aspect of, of this stuff worked around and brought it back here. Yeah, I would see that would be really cool. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Universal lately, but it's the back lot is pretty much, it's, it's still there, but, you know, now that they opened up Harry Potter, there's a huge roller coaster going right down now between oh, the back yeah. lot. Yeah, that roller coaster is like right next to the soundstage. That we call yeah, the, who, 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 who did that, you know? Mm-hmm. It just goes, you know, for the case of the state of Florida, it's just looking at tourism more than the actual industry. And at the same point, you know, you realize that, what do you think brought the tourists to Florida? What do you think Universal Studios is? It's a movie studio. It's about entertainment. It's about film. It's about television. That's what's bringing it. You know, they're not coming just to ride the rides. They're coming to be part of the movies. And when you take that aspect out and you make it more just a theme park, you know, then you kind of lose a lot of the luster, I think. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, would I love it to come back? Yeah, I would. You know, being here locally, I've been fortunate enough to be busy for the last... You know, 20 or so years, not really having to leave the state and making it to, you know, do a lot of live entertainment stuff and, you know, not so much film and television just because it's been so, so slow here in the last couple of years, but, um, you know, doing a lot of live entertainment stuff has been really, it's been cool. You can bring a lot of those elements into live, into, into live entertainment, you know, because Nickelodeon was live. There was a lot of live stuff that we did there that was really cool, but I try to, I try to bring back as much as I can when I know I have a large kid audience and I, I go that extra mile to bring as much of that I can back into it. And uh, it does make a difference. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would love to hear what you're doing because it sounds like you're really passionate about the kid audience. Do you mind explaining what you're working on these days and what you're doing? Yeah, well, back in 1997, I formed a nonprofit entertainment company for kids. Yeah. And what that entity was was... I, I was, at that time, I was at the point that, you know, not that I had kids at that time, but I realized that how powerful the entertainment industry was into developing and moving kids' mind. And I was really just becoming disenfranchised with a lot of stuff that was going on in the entertainment world and how kids were really being led down the wrong path of life, you know, you know, being followers versus leaders, you know, not... not believing in themselves type of thing. So we formed this nonprofit company and we did um, on the basis of instilling these good character traits back into the educational system of, of the minds of the kids and we did a lot with the public schools over the years. We did these huge, huge um, arena shows, Broadway style shows. It's all based off of comedy, but we did a lot of the Nickelodeon type stuff. You know, it was a, it was a comedy, but we also it was a one man, one microphone, and laughing laughs. More of a comic guy, but the guy would give, you know, kind of like a lot of slapstick things. So I, you know, pretty much did that for 
for 18 years and did a lot of film and television stuff in between that. We produced a couple of shows that um, some of them were on the state based market, some were not. Uh, we actually did a version of, it was called It's a God Thing. And this was back in, I'm going to say, just as I left Nickelodeon, we brought in a lot of Nickelodeon guys in to work on the show, and it was this whole big thing about um, stations. Uh, I want to say the station. It's it just this whole religious thing about sin and what it looks like on you versus being clean type of thing. And so we would, you know, did a lot of it with the slop and mess Nickelodeon style. And so it was this whole outdoor thing that we did, and it was really cool. It came out really good. It actually aired in a lot of places around the world. Uh, I think had only like one billion viewership on the, on the series that we did. But anyway, so that was that. And then I have since resigned from that company to get back into producing some other stuff that I'd like to do. And uh, that's kind of where I'm at now, doing a lot of live event stuff. And actually, I'm working on the show right now that I'm putting together for February uh, with Phil Moore. Uh, Phil Moore is going to come out and be my MC on this live Men, this thing I got going on for men, I'm going to have 4,500 men here in Orlando. We're going to have a good old time and teach them how to be men. So, oh, Okay, my jaw just dropped when you said Fillmore is coming down to work on something. Um, I think I'm definitely going to look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's a cool guy, man. We go back way back in the day. We actually, believe it or not, we went to the same church back in Orlando when he was here and, and stuff. And, um we didn't know each other until we met each other at church, and like I knew, that, and I didn't know him until I seen him one day. I was working on one of the shows at Nickelodeon, and he was he came up and was one of the warm up guys for the, you know, the between shots. And I see this guy going out there talking, and I remember he, and I heard his voice, and I remember hearing his voice in church, and so it was just we just became really good friends over the years. He's a, he's a fantastic producer as well. He's a good writer. Oh, yeah. uh, he's got, he, I mean, he's he's very talented, Phil. And, um, I wish I could work with him a lot more. I'm going to hopefully try to do that in some of the other projects we got coming up. So. Yeah, he won an Emmy for his writing back uh, a long time ago. So he's definitely he's more known as he definitely has a lot more things to just just a hosting duty. He has like a vision and he just does a lot of things with um and he's still doing the stuff like for Nick Arcade with um J James Bethea and Kareem Atep. They worked on something recently um not too long ago. And they're trying to get developed right now, but he still got it. I must say he still has it. Yeah, you know what's good about Phil is he's not a neck down guy. You know, he's not a guy that you just tell him what to do. And he just, I mean, not that he can't do that, but he, he, he's, he's creative. He'll come up with ideas and he'll, you know, you put him in a situation and he'll be able to make it better, you know, or at least collaborate to make it better type of a thing. And that, that's what you want in the creative. It's not about the one, it's about the team. And when you can pull that all off, make, make a happy production. You know, as a producer, as, as people, you know, you all want to kind of you go into a project that you've mentioned what you think the project's going to be, but when you start getting into the actual reality of what happens on the show and, and the pre-production and the development and the actual show days, how these different elements are, move you and shape you in different paths, um, you know, you, you, sometimes you come out with a product you thought you were going to have, and sometimes you come out with a product that's way better than you thought you were going to have. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you two are going to work magnificently together, and I think you have a great um, vision. I think you have a great mind as well, just from talking to you, and I loved hearing what you had to say. And I just have one last question. What do you think made Nickelodeon Studios in Florida so great and special, looking back on it? You know, what do I think made it that great? I don't think it was anything, one thing that made it that great. It was a collaborative. I think it was, it was its purpose in time. Does this sound, you know, not to sound all philosophical, but I mean, it was, it was at that moment, it was something that needed to be there, and it did what it did, and it, and it created an atmosphere that propelled a lot of people into different, different walks of life. You know, it, it was a bunch of different things. It was, it was everybody from, the low guy in the total pole to the drivers to the transportation guys to the, to the people that were making the decisions. And, yeah, was it sad to see it go? You know, I remember leaving in 97, 98 and, and hearing the stories that Albie was talking about, you know, leaving, you know, fucking out of there and taking out. And, and the day that it left, it was like a real, you know, I think it was 2007 or somewhere in 2007, yeah, right. somewhere around there. 2005 when it actually left, yeah. yeah. It was just kind of a... Uh, 
you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, when you have a really good time, you have the separation anxiety type thing, I guess, you realize everything's not that. Every project you work on with, with creative people and you have a good time, there's always that separation anxiety. You know, you, you know when you work on a film shoot for three months with somebody, then, you know, at the end of the three months, you don't see him the next day, it kind of creates that, that little, oh man, I miss you. But, you know, you, you work, realize you work again, it's a, it's a family type thing. And that's what's happened. A lot of these guys, at least a lot of the art guys pretty much have stayed here in town and they've been really busy working at Universal itself. And a lot of the guys actually uh, opened up uh, work on Harry Potter. But yeah, you know, say it was one thing. I think it was a sense of community, a sense of feeling a purpose. You know, that we were there to do something. And, and, and I think, and I, you know what, I think it was, it wasn't work. That's what it was. It was not work. It was play. We had fun. Yeah. When you when you when you do what you're supposed to do, it's not work. It becomes life. It becomes fun. And when it becomes work is when you don't want to be there because that's when you don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. But this wasn't work. It was it was fun. You know, we had fun creating. We were given the liberty to do so. And the founder of Nickelodeon, she was a school teacher. You know, she loved kids. She had, you know. She loved creativity, and she, you know, and her essence of what that was all created kind of used out of all that and allowed us to do what we needed to be. Now, where we get today, I don't know. Um, I know they're doing some stuff here and there, but I just haven't followed them too much. You know, what they're doing, I don't even have cable in my house now, so I don't even know what's on Nickelodeon. I'm not watching it. Neither, man. So, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, one thing sure I do want to say is I just remember. Um, the Agricrag, I that was like the coolest thing in the world, and knowing behind the scenes what that was all like, and, and the amount of tech that went into that thing to build that thing was incredible. And it, 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 I, you know, when you see it from the camera angle, you look at all this this paint and foam, and, mm-hmm. and they, when you went behind the stage, you realize you saw this forty foot wall of just pipe and metal, and all the intricacies of all the. Uh, Special effects that went in there with the lights, you know, the electric and the and the and the smoke and the nitrous, all that stuff that was in there, um, the compressed air. It was just, you know, it was all these. These guys used to hang hammocks in there and just kind of sleep in the hammocks, thirty feet up in the air. It was really cool. So, right, it was all fun stuff. Right. And I remember one day um, we were we just got done shooting or something like this and then one of the producers came down and said, hey, you guys, we're going to work late tonight and then we were like, okay, cool, but come to find out why is Steven Spielberg was here and they are at the park, at the theme park, at the, at, oh, at, the, at the studio. He came down, he used to come down here a lot to Florida because I guess he was part of yeah, all that developing stuff. Beginning, yeah. yeah, yeah, Jaws and E.T. and all that stuff. But I think it's one of the reasons why E.T. is still there. But anyway, but he um, he brought his kids there, so we closed down the studio, and we did a full run through the agro crag with the kids, and that was just hilarious. That was fun. Oh, so, yeah. That's a that's So we did, the, we did the full run through. I mean, they're like full. I mean, everything from the smoke to the, the air blast to everything, the sound effects, and Michael Malley and, and Mo, they, everybody was there. We did a full run through. Like, it was like it was a real show. We dressed the kids up, they put them in the helmet, the whole gab, barb, everything. So it was really cool. Yeah, definitely. So. It, it's so amazing how much the legacy that um, Nick Studios was had. And I'm going to sound really quintessential and pretentious, but I don't think I don't think I'll ever be forgotten. Like I don't care if Blue Man Group is there. I think people will always have remembered that it was Nick and the presence is still there because you hear stories about people breaking in and stuff, and it's that just goes to show how much it touched and impacted people's lives. You know. Yeah, no, it is. And it's not so much, you know, it's the industry, too, as a whole, but also, like I said, it, it was for that time. And for that time, for, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of people worked for, for that organization at that time. You know, that, that affected them. And that catapulted them into different directions, wherever there are at this time. They'll never forget that, because that was like a real-world, real-life thing. And, uh, and it was for me, too. So... But all is good, and I, I, I really enjoy talking to you about all this. Oh, and, uh, oh I enjoy talking to you about that too, man. I enjoyed it. I mean, it's really. We have to say thank you first for all for participating. And yeah, but anytime you have any questions, you know, open door, man. Just holler, send me an email. If I can help you out, I will. Okay, I definitely will. I'll definitely keep in touch. And thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. You 
YouTube. God bless you, man. See you. All right, bye-bye.